evening, everyone. My name is Matthew McGlade. I'm the lead and teaching pastor here at Mansfield Pentecostal Church, where every Tuesday night we have our thought to think about, a question to ponder, and a text to study. And we're continuing our Bible study uh, teaching series titled Rightly Dividing. And we're looking at good practice and seeking to understand and interpret the scripture. Just as the farmer plows uh, the field, and there's a right way of doing that so that the crops can grow. As the stonemason rightly cuts the stones to fit them together, so there's a right way in which we are to approach the scriptures and understand them accurately. And it starts by us coming to the Bible with a right heart. We come uh, to learn and to receive from, from, from his word, keeping in mind that the most important um, tool to keep in mind when it comes to understanding the scriptures is that context, that word, that context is king. Now so far in our series we've looked at the importance of reading the part of the Bible in the context of the whole of the Bible, allowing the whole of the Bible to inform our understanding of the, of the verse of the scripture that we're reading. We've looked at the how to follow the flow of thought, uh, the use of a, a, a words and language in, in, the, in the Bible. And last week you remember we looked at what I believe is possibly the most important aspect of uh, understanding the scriptures and that is knowing how to compare scripture with scripture and you remember that last week we looked at three ways in which we could do that and uh, we looked at look at similar passages of scripture written by the same author we looked at uh, look at other passages of scripture that look at similar historical events as well as comparing the old testament and the new testament and in that way we are illuminated um, by the part of the Bible that we're reading. Uh, given that all the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, that means uh, we can use other parts of the scripture to help us aid our understanding of the part that we're, we're, we're reading. Now what I want to do tonight is that I want to look at three other ways and how we compare scripture with scripture uh, to gain a better insight into the Bible. Uh, the fourth way, and this is continuing on obviously from last week, is to look at parallel passages with similar phrases. Uh, for, you, for example, have you ever wondered what that phrase meant in the Bible that describes David as a man who is after God's own heart? Now, you may wonder, what does that mean? Well, the clue is actually found further on in the Bible in the book of Acts. Uh, when Paul says of David that after removing Saul, he, David, may, he, David, their king, sorry, I'll read that again. After removing Saul, he made David their king, and God testified concerning him, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything that I want him to do. Now, David was by no means a perfect man. He had, a, had his moral failings. And yet the Bible still describes him as a man after God's own heart. And the reason for that is because he was described as a man who did everything that God required him throughout his life. He fulfilled God's purpose in his generation. The idea of doing uh, all, the, all that God wants is further highlighted in the book of Samuel when the Lord says that I'll raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to all that is in my heart and my mind. And so David being described as a man after God's own heart uh, describes someone who was committed to fulfilling everything that was on God's heart and mind. He wasn't out for his own agenda. He wasn't out for doing his own thing. He was out for serving the God's purpose in his, in his generation. What does Paul mean when he says, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus? What does he mean by that? And um, the Catholic Church historically I've sometimes used this idea of uh, the mystical stigmata signs that somehow that when Paul says, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus, that the, the mysterious signs of Jesus' nail prints were on, on his hands or that the scars of Jesus were on his hands. Well, there's nothing mystical about it at all. At all. In my mind, that's a little bit superstitious. Okay, the, uh, It's very clear that when Paul says that, he's referring that to the sufferings of Christ in his life. And so um, Paul says elsewhere in his letter to the Corinthians, he says that I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, I've been flogged more severely, I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. 
Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've spent a night and, and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger in, 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 from the rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews. I bear danger, uh, I'm danger sorry, from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at the sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled. I've, I've often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst. I've often gone without food. I've been cold. So it's clear that Paul is talking about his own sufferings and not, as the Catholic Church suggests, um, the marks of Jesus on, on his body. The second thing that uh, you, or the, sorry, I should say, the fifth thing that you can do to help um, compare scripture with scripture is look at parallel passages that deal with similar ideas. Uh, you'll often find that uh, some Bibles have what we call a topical concordance on the back of them. For example, the Thompson Chain Reference Bible is an example that you look at a passage of scripture, you can go to the back of the, 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 the Bible and there it, there's, it gives a topical reference where it looks at other passages of scriptures that look at similar, uh, other scriptures that, that deal with similar ideas behind what, what you're reading. Uh, the Knaves Topical Bible is another example of that as a really good, use, useful tool. Uh, so you'll remember that um, earlier on in our teaching, when we looked at the various I idioms that are used throughout the scripture and idiomatic language, when Jesus said that if anyone comes to me and does not hate their, her, uh, their father or mother, wife or children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, that such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, clearly Jesus didn't mean that literally. He didn't mean you have to literally hate them. But what he was saying is that by comparison, you love Jesus more than even your closest relatives. Now, if we compare that idea with a similar idea found elsewhere in the Gospels, particularly in Matthew's Gospel, it reads as follows, that anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So by comparing passages with similar ideas or topics, you can gain a better understanding into what you are reading. So let's let's keep in mind, uh, look at p phrases, look at compare passages with similar ideas, with similar phrases. But also, uh, the sixth thing that we can do uh, in, when, it com when it comes to comparing scripture with scripture is to look at parallel passages with contrasting ideas to get a better understanding. When studying the Bible, you'll often come to uh, passages of scripture that would on the surface appear to contradict, but actually there are passages that you really just have to wrestle with uh, and they, they are create a real tension in terms of coming to terms with. For example, there are passages of scripture that have tensions that challenge us and how we think about Jesus. How can Jesus be both fully God and fully man? How can God be wholly present uh, in one place and, and in one place at the same time? Um, how can he be, sorry, everywhere I should say, and yet at one place at a specific time? How can he, how can we reconcile the ideas of divine determinism, in other words that God is in control and that God is sovereign, and human free will. How is the Bible God's word and yet at the same time fully a work of man? On the surface this seems to contradict and yet the Bible teaches both. Uh, they don't appear to have a rational explanation. In, in Romans the idea of God's sovereignty, uh, Paul, Paul makes this exclamation, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his, are his judgments and his paths are beyond tracing out. And so there are tensions in, in what we believe about Jesus. There are also tensions about ethical tensions of how we to behave. For example, on the one hand, we're told not to judge. Jesus said, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you'll be judged, and with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. And yet, on the other hand, it is clear that we are to make judgments on certain situations. 
So again, Jesus says, watch out for false prophets. They'll come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do not pick, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And so these contrasting ideas would suggest that on the one hand we are to judge and the other hand we're not to judge. So clearly what is meant is that we're not to be partaking in destructive criticism or gossip about other people. But on the other hand, we are to weigh what others say and of seeing what, what they say is in accordance with what is true. As well as that, there are also tensions in the Bible about Jesus' title as Messiah. And uh, many Jewish people expected that Jesus would come as a political Messiah to establish the fullness of God's kingdom on earth and destroy the Romans and, and, kick, and kick them out. Uh, many of the Essenes, or, or the Jewish, the ancient uh, first century Jews, or the Essenes and the Zealots, were anticipating that the day that the Son of David would come and establish the fullness of the kingdom on earth. When Isaiah proclaimed of the greatness of his government and peace, there'll be no end. He will reign on David's throne over his kingdom. There, were, there was this expecta expectation of this triumphant Messiah who will come to establish the rule on earth. And yet, at the same time, there are also passages of scripture, particularly again from the prophet Isaiah, where it speaks of the Messiah who had come as a suffering servant. So, but he was, so the Bible says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we would be healed. And that presented a real problem, particularly for the first century Jewish scribes when they saw Jesus, because they thought when they saw him on the cross, that any hope of him being the Messiah in their minds was dispelled. How can the Messiah, how could Jesus fulfill the call of Messiah to be the political ruler and leader of, of Israel and the world at that time and yet die such a horrendous death? And yet they failed to see actually that the Messiah had to come on two occasions. The first time to redeem humanity to himself, but the second time to rule as king on, on earth. And so these are the tensions in the Bible. Uh, so it's good to compare scripture that looks at similar phrases, similar ideas, but also compare scripture that, that has contrasting ideas and wrestle with those tensions uh, to gain a better insight and understanding of what, what is actually happening. And so when we come to the scripture, value the importance of comparing scripture with scripture. However, it's also important to have a balanced approach, realizing that there are some ideas that we need to hold intention and that there are some ideas that we may never really fully be able to grasp at least this side of eternity that will remain mysteries for us well guys i hope we've managed to get something out of our time together and uh, just as a question to ponder uh, i would like you to um discuss this question within your life groups are there any parts of the bible which you struggle with in your understanding what are they are there any parallel scriptures that you are aware of that might help that you better help you understand other parts of the Bible? And then for your text of study, I'd like you to read Proverbs chapter 26, verses 4 to 5. And I'd like you to describe what is the tension that is in that passage of scripture? What is the tension and how can that be resolved? Guys, hope you got something out of uh, this tonight. And uh, listen, have a great rest of the evening. And I look forward to seeing you over the weekend. God bless you all.